So, for those who I have not met, my name is Edward Halperin. I'm the Chancellor of the College and Provost for Biomedical Affairs at Turo. The College wants to thank Moisha Dane and Alan Fagan of the Orthodox Union for arranging for our conference room this evening and thanks to everyone for staying on schedule. The idea of getting over 80 people on a staggered tours of rooms to 20 in the museum and not losing anyone and getting them all in one piece was a non-trivial logistical event. Thank you. And before we move on, where it's Okay. Yes. May I suggest that we owe the thanks to the founders of the feast, Bay and Jennifer. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> Dr. Amler was smiling like a false. Thanks, Dr. Amler. <laughs> um, anyone who wants a copy of my slides, I brought as much as I felt I could carry for one from Jennifer. Has them. If you want a copy of slides and you don't get a copy from Jennifer, you have things called email. You'll send me an email. We'll send you one. We have uh, three events for dinner, uh, two brief presentations by myself and Dr. Bezzo, and then a panel discussion hosted by Kevin. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about a character who appears in the last panel in the exhibit right as you go through the door, <coughs> Hannah Arendt and her book, Eichmann in Jerusalem and the concept of the finality of evil. Uh, Rent comes into the story most directly with the story of the capture in Argentina in May of 1960. As the docents, I'm sure, told all the groups, our story takes place in an unattractive suburb of Buenos Aires in a concrete flat with no running water or electricity with Eichmann requires and the story of his talkative teenage son trying to impress the new date and tipping off the girl's father, a Holocaust survivor of the presence of Eichmann in Buenos Aires. Ben Gurion, uh, the story of Ben Gurion as shown in the exhibit was correct but not Total. He first makes the announcement to the cabinet in the morning of the day in May, and then goes to the Knesset a few hours later and goes public with the announcement, uh, carefully worded, Eichmann is in custody and will stand trial. Uh, the exhibit does not describe the breaking of diplomatic relations between Argentina and Israel, the UN debates over the kidnapping of a citizen of a sovereign country and the transport of this individual in an impaired state across international boundaries to stand trial in another country. After, however, Israel and Argentina break diplomatic relations, Israel has the public relations problem of kidnapping a citizen and transporting him across international boundaries in an extrajudicial process. Argentina has a public relations problem also, which is what was he doing in this country for over a decade in safe harbor, and why wasn't anything done about it? What did you know, and when did you know it? Israel and Argentina resumed diplomatic relations about three to four months later. The Argentines basically want this story to go away, and the matter is, as a diplomatic matter, dropped. Uh, Eichmann is as the tour guide probably told you, uh, a diffident student does not make do well getting out of high school, works as a salesman for a Jewish-owned oil firm, and like other disaffected young Austrians and Germans, finds a home in the Nazi party and becomes the man in the glass food. His story then intersects with a German Jewish woman philosophy student, a student of Heidegger, Hannah Arendt. Arendt uh, recently had a brief article in the foreword when someone finds her library card 
during her time living in France. She comes to America and lives and teaches here in New York. In this portrayal, to me, she looks like Eleanor Roosevelt. But this is the formal Hana Arendt picture. And those of you who saw the recent biopic about Arendt, the actress is made up to look like this. She convinces uh, Wallace Shawn of The New Yorker that she should be hired as a special correspondent for The New Yorker magazine to cover the trial in Israel. And goes to Israel. Her articles are serialized in The New Yorker and appear in a compilation, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. And I suspect that many of you had this as required reading in a college political science or philosophy course, uh, as you can see from my dog-eared copy that sits on my shelf in Valhalla. There are interesting chapters in which she writes about why weren't the roundups of the Jews en masse successful in Bulgaria in Albania, in Denmark. She is very controversial in the Jewish community for her writings about what she refers to as Jewish cooperation and collaboration and is denounced by some writers. The essence of the argument is this concept of the banality of evil, in which she writes that evil may be articulated and promulgated by sociopaths, but for evil to succeed in the world is when the average person evil as normative. Are these human cargo that you are making train schedules of to transport? Is that just another cargo engineer? What were you thinking about when you organized the train? What were you thinking about when you made the train schedule? What were you thinking about in the chemical factory when someone started ordering poison gas and you knew it wasn't for fumigating crops or industrial use, it was for killing people? Was it just another job? If you treat evil as normative, then she writes, evil succeeds. She is particularly unimpressed with the defendant. She writes in the book, he speaks lousy German. He is uneducated. He is not articulate. However, she is an even-handed disperser of contempt. She has contempt for Gideon Hauser. She cannot understand why the trial is being conducted in this absurd language Hebrew. The judges are all German. The defendant is German. They are educated Germans, the judges. Why isn't the trial being conducted in proper German and get it over with? Of course, Hausner is <coughs> Polish. Uh, she's quite dismissive of the Polish prosecutor. Uh, why can't this trial be conducted in proper German? Um, the concept of the banality of evil is a great success intellectually of Arendt. For example, Civil War historians, historians of slavery, what was the ship's architect thinking when he got a commission to design a new ship and was told to maximize cargo carrying capability of the ship and starts drawing diagrams of human beings for the transport of human chattel from West Africa to North America. Was it just another job? Were you happy to collect your fee for doing this? The medical students have heard me present medical bills for the medical care of slaves. Did the doctor think anything unusual about saying medical care for the human belonging to Mrs. Dips? Or was it just another medical bill? Um, however, uh, the controversy about rent, in addition to her writings about collaboration, are some people's direct attacks on the concept of the banality of evil. Uh, was, in her mind, Eichmann an uneducated cog in the wheel, or was he himself a committed, true believer, sociopath, and while there was no evidence presented at trial, he took a revolver out of his pocket and shot anyone, you need to put a revolver in someone's head and fire in order to be a murderer, did a rent in some sense give, get, let him off too easy. To give you some flavor of the formidable intellect of Arendt, this is a partial listing of her books in English. Um, whoops. Uh, and certainly her most uh, widely read book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, which comes out a decade before uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem. But you can see in her writings a mixture of 
of heavy political theory treatises, uh, and some books on, on the Jewish experience. <clears throat> uh, for those of you who have not encountered her writings, some of them will you will understand my use of the comment. She comes across in her writings as the consummate Yeki, the German Jewish, we were better than everyone else, and the writings about why can't this trial be conducted in proper German. If you want to read the other side of the story, I would strongly recommend uh, Deborah Lipstadt's book, which I saw was on sale in the, in the museum bookstore, Eichmann on Trial. Lipstadt takes Arendt's book on page by page in her new book. And if you want to see the real work in the trenches of a historian, Lipstadt goes through Arendt's travel vouchers for reimbursement from the New Yorker and demonstrates conclusively that she spent a lot of the trial at a spa in Germany, <laughs> that she wasn't there, and that she was reading transcripts or watching tapes like everybody else, so her eyewitness reporting was not an eyewitness reporting. Now, our tour guide pointed out how the Israelis used only Sephardic guards, both in the prison and at the trial in the community center, in Tel Aviv. This is Arendt writing to a colleague. This is not part of the book. This is her writing to a colleague about observations at the trial. And I put the quote up so you get some flavor of her personality. On top, the judges, the best of German Jewry. Below them, the prosecuting attorneys. He's referring to Gideon Hauser, Galicians, but still at least Europeans. Everything was organized by a police force. It gives me the creeps speaks only Hebrew and looks Arabic, some downright brutal types among them. They would obey any order. She is referring to Jewish policemen. They would obey any order. And outside the door is the Oriental mob, as if one were in Istanbul or some other half-Asiatic country. Uh, this is clearly not the uh, true believer Zionist going back to the state of Israel to observe the trial. Um, this is a concluding paragraph of Eichmann in Jerusalem, which uh, I will conclude with for you. So you see her take, she spends a long time saying there has been no evidence presented in this trial that warrants the conviction of capital offense murder. As she compliments the judges for pointing out, Mr. Hausner, stay on task. This is not a history class. This is not a polemic. What is the evidence to be presented about the defendant in the dock? Um, Hausner, of course, is under directions from Ben Gurion to, to educate the world. So her concluding paragraph, just as you, Eichmann, supported, this is her, as if she were going to be the judge, what would she have said in passing verdict? Just as you supported and carried out a policy of not wanting to share the earth with the Jewish people and the people of a number of other nations, as though you and your superiors had any right to determine who should or should not inhabit the world, we find that no one, that is, no member of the human race, be expected to want to share the earth with you. This is the reason, the only reason, uh, you must hang a, a, a rather uh, idiosyncratic take on the trial. And that, friends, is what I wanted to introduce you to uh, this evening about the legacy of Hannah Arendt and what we saw in the exhibit. Our next speaker will be Professor Bedzo, um, who's going to share with us some thoughts about lessons for biomedical ethics and the Nuremberg Code and things that emerge I do want to talk about why uh, learning about the Holocaust uh, is important or uh, valuable in medical school education. Uh, and it, it might seem very counterintuitive. For example, medical schools, unlike graduate schools, history departments, uh, humanities programs, uh, is supposed to teach medical professionals competency. Uh, those competencies uh, it's just the medical knowledge, communication, the professional collaboration, and so forth. Uh, learning about history uh, may provide a means for the physician to become more well-rounded, maybe more humanistic. Uh, but in the same respect, there's a lot of other examples in history that, forget negative, positive examples in history that you can learn about in order to learn about uh, where healthcare is today and what type of doctor you should be. So what about the Holocaust would be important for us to even think about is, as, as essential or, or necessary to incorporate in medical school education. So I'm going to give uh, four examples, one of which has to do with who you become as doctors, 
And three have to do with profession as, as, as a social force or a social influence in society. So with regards to the uh, uh, professional identity formation of, of a physician, the Holocaust is actually really important. And it's important for two reasons. One, because unlike any other genocide in history, the Holocaust was seen as a public health campaign. So once you recognize that it's seen as a public health campaign, you can understand why uh, physicians were the largest uh, professional group to join the Nazi party by, by numbers. Uh, it wasn't just marginal in terms of there were a number of doctors, a number of lawyers, and so forth. Uh, uh, physicians were uh, the driving force behind uh, the Holocaust. And that's even understanding that uh, German medical schools were the academic uh, excellence uh, and set the standard for medical education in Germany and the world, uh, how Germany had uh, medical ethics codes and were seen as the most ethical, uh, were seen as the most ethical um, uh, professional class uh, in, in the country and in the world. You know, something actually struck me when you watch the video where Eichmann says, you know, how could you, they ask Eichmann, how could you do all this stuff? And he says, I would never uh, violate an oath that I made. It's so much worse to violate an oath than having the consequence of killing millions upon millions of people. So then you think about it and you say, wait, all of these medical professionals uh, took an oath in the Hippocratic Oath in the beginning of their profession. Why did they not see that taking of an oath would be so much stronger than any other uh, public persuasion? Uh, and the, the reason is when you look at an oath and you look at a, a performative act that may obligate you to do something, uh, that's very different than the semantics that were used in terms of looking at the health of the nation, looking at the professional identity uh, of how doctors were incorporated into the Nazi party, and the habits of medical professionals, uh, and where they saw the benefits <coughs> to uh, the German people as opposed to the individual people. So in terms of looking at professional uh, identity formation, the Holocaust is actually very important to understand and is relevant for today. The three other examples have to do with uh, where medical professionals can, can benefit or, or advocate in public discourse in healthcare. So today we seem to have a, a, a huge problem with regards to communication. Uh, we seem to have something called the internet, uh, where everyone provides information, whether it's true or not true, we, we, we have to worry about what types of facts are being presented not only in terms of uh, policy and politics, but also in terms of having patients come and say, this is information that I got off the internet. Tell me why it's wrong. Why can't I follow it? We think that this is a very new in history where information has become democratized. In the 1920s and 1930s, there was also a new media that was used uh, to uh, uh, disseminate ideology as opposed to facts. And it was also a very nervous time in social discourse in terms of what are we supposed to do with this type of information. That was the, the time where radio became very popular. So if we look at history and how radio was used to uh, look at public opinion, uh, look at the way uh, people were getting information, we might be able to learn what types of responsibilities and accountabilities we have to the new type of communication media that's being used today. The second has to do with uh, uh, Medical technology and, 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 and patient advocacy, let's say. So today, there's two big issues that we that, that go to a medical conference are always brought up. Uh, uh, genetics and uh, genetic engineering and uh, death with dignity laws. So when we look at both of genetics, genetic engineering, and death with dignity laws, there's always an ethicist who comes up and raises the pros, raises the cons, looks at the risks, uh, and looks at the social implications. And we think, oh, it's such an exciting time because look at how medical technology has advanced, look at how patient uh, autonomy has advanced, and we can have these types of, of conversations. These also are not new. Uh, the eugenics movement uh, and the social and ethical implications that started uh, at, at the turn of the century, we're still asking the same questions that were asked then. So if we can learn at what, which questions were being asked and how they were being answered, we may be able to have a, a, a not only historical, but a, a contemporarily relevant view on genetics and genetic engineering. Same with physician-assisted suicide. In the uh, early 1900s, late, late 1800s, uh, Carl Bildug, Bild uh, who was a German jurist, wrote a book on physician aid and dying in euthanasia, uh, which way before the Nazi party, but laid out the legal and ethical mores that should be considered 
when looking at Asian positioning and that. The arguments that he makes and the responses that he has are very similar to the discussions that we're having now with death with, with, death, with dignity loss in the United States. The third implication is uh, with regards to healthcare economy and systems-based practices. So today we are beginning to see, we think this is new also, we're beginning to see the business of healthcare taking over from the professional ethos of healthcare, where the patient-physician encounter is becoming diminished, therefore the uh, patient-physician relationship is becoming deteriorated, insurance companies are getting more involved, the government is getting more involved, and it seems to be eroding the professional autonomy of the medical system. We see this as a, as a challenge that we're going to have to deal with uh, in terms of how do you maintain that type of professional integrity in a time when you have less power and authority. This also is not new. This happened in the Weimar Republic in the 1920s. And one, is, one of the reasons why uh, the, the German doctors were so easily swayed into looking at joining the Nazi party for the betterment, betterment of the German people. They also had a diminished amount of uh, time and, and, and focus on individual patients. They also were influenced by the insurance companies and, and the healthcare system in Germany uh, that influenced the types of procedures, the types of alternatives, the communication they can have with their patients. So if we look at the contemporary view of healthcare, not as something new, but to get historical context, that can allow us to be just more informed and better professionals as we uh, enter the public space. The key in understanding the Holocaust and its relevance is nobody learns from moral saints or uh, moral diplomacy. We think that moral saints are way too glorious and too virtuous that we don't relate to them, and we think that villains are people that are definitely not us and people that we also can't learn from. What was amazing about the, the museum tonight, uh, and something that we, we should always remember, uh, is that not all German physicians saw themselves as bad or as evil. Um, but when evil comes, it comes in that very relatable way of, oh, I can see this happening. Right? I, can, I can understand that I'm just following orders. I can understand how this, the pull of history is going a certain way. You don't have to go to the Milgram experiments or the Zimbardo experiments. You can go to history to see how uh, the professional integrity that you have has to be continually reinforced, not just with an oath, but through daily practices, through habits of, of, of ethics and integrity, uh, and being truly informed on where your profession has gone and where it's going to go. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ira. So I'm a medical research assistant working with Dr. Halperin, and I'm also a teaching assistant for Dr. Halperin's history of medicine class that that he teaches every spring. So in May 2017, the history of medicine class had a term paper assignment, and that each student had to write a 500 word term paper on one of the 100 famous figures in the history of medicine. So 15 of the, one of, 15 of the students in the class opted to go a different route in that they wanted to interview a Holocaust survivor identified by the Westchester Holocaust Speakers Bureau and they had to talk about the interview and discuss the interview, what they learned from the interview, uh, and, and place it and put it in context um, in, in, in such for the, for the term paper of the class. So just some of the questions that, were, that they had to answer for, for interviewing a Holocaust survivor were to describe any medical consequences to the person uh, of interest of their Holocaust experience, for example, any post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety attacks, tuberculosis, if they were subject to any medical experimentation, etc. Also, to place the person that you interviewed into historical context in the history of medicine with reference to books such as Daily Medicine or other sources. Daily Medicine, which I have over here, uh, thank you, uh, it examines the critical role played by German physicians, scientists, really, I think I should put down. <laughs> German physicians, scientists, uh, academic experts, and public health officials in implementing and supporting. Uh, racial eugenics in the Nazi program, which culminated in the Holocaust. So with us tonight, we have four of the students who are kind enough to join us, and they're going to talk about their experience interviewing the Holocaust survivors, what they learned from it, what they gained from it. So by right now, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves, just tell them your name, where you're from, and why you opted to interview a Holocaust survivor, as opposed to going the normal route of, uh, of doing one of the 100 
famous leaders. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm Kate Morant, I'm from Connecticut, and we're, we're all second years at New York Medical College. Um, I really enjoyed Dr. Halpern's class, and um, I wanted to choose to interview a survivor, I mean, in part because, um, you know, it's always more interesting to talk to someone in person than, than read about them um, on paper. And I also, I was not raised Jewish, um, and so, if that was a really valuable experience. I was telling my peers about how some of my friends, like I was so excited about the opportunity and some of my friends were saying, who, who are Jewish were saying, oh, my grandmother, my grandfather is a survivor. Um, and so they thought it was sort of silly that I was so excited, but um, it was really valuable for me for that reason. Um, yeah, I'll get more into the detail. Um, hi, I'm Alicia, I'm from California. And um, I think I chose to write um, a paper about a interview with Survivor for many of the same reasons as Kate said. Um, I think it provided an opportunity to hear someone's story and I really enjoy hearing anyone's story and especially one that was so significant in this <coughs> um, My name is Stan and I'm up front and uh, part of the reason why uh, this seemed like a good idea, uh, I mean, first of all, like you said, it was uh, it was a little more seemed a little more exciting than than uh, diving into books or Wikipedia for a few hours. Um, and um, also, I grew up in a French family, and for us, the Holocaust, for its own reasons, is like a really big part of sort of our national conversation. And this, but yet speaking directly to Holocaust survivors, is something I've never done. So it seemed like a good way to uh, sort of dig a little deeper in that uh, that knowledge. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Nico. Uh, I'm also a second year med student uh, from Connecticut. Um, so I wanted to do this because I don't really know that I've had any other opportunity to get to learn about history uh, from a primary source to, to talk to them about their own experiences um, instead of learning from a textbook or from, from classes. So, yeah. <laughs> So I'm just going to ask them a few questions, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A if you guys have any questions for the panelists about the, what they experienced. So first question, uh, what did you feel were the take-home messages from this project? Um, so for me, um, a lot of the things I learned were things I already knew, um, but sometimes it's hard to internalize unless you look through them yourself or you talk to somebody. Um, and it, for me, it kind of fell into two categories. And so I talked to Dr. Moshe Abital, um, who went on after the Holocaust to get his PhD and is very outspoken about his story. And, um, and so uh, these are two of his books. And one is sort of about his life and the details of it. And the other is called The Failure of Man and the Enigma of God's Silence, um, which gets more into the philosophical and religious aspect. And so um, when I say that's kind of how I think about it, um, for me, it was very useful to learn more about the details and um, some of the background of his life um, in order to understand kind of how it developed. And then also just to force myself to think about um, really deeply on a personal level with this person in front of me who's telling me his very personal stories, what it would um, feel like and how it would challenge your internal beliefs, you know, whether you're somebody who's a victim of something like this or... Um, like Dr. Halpern and Dr. Bedsa were talking about, if you're a health professional, for example, who is um, confronted with an ethical problem or something of, of greater magnitude. Um, and in, in the technical sense, like Dr. Bedsa was saying about genetics and all of the new technologies we have, um, a lot of the lessons to be learned from the Holocaust and from survivors are really subtle. And so um, kind of being aware of the small ways in which we're confronted with small ethical problems all the time and how those develop and some of the, the simple ways that we approach um, those questions. So whether it's informed by the oaths that we take or our own personal beliefs, um, I think it's important to think about and to learn from history how, how you view those things. Um, yeah, so I thought that the major take message that I got um, the woman who I interviewed uh, was able to escape from Germany, and she was in France through most of the Holocaust. And so I got a very, um, I guess, a perspective I wasn't used to hearing from uh, someone who had survived 
she, although she was not put in concentration camps, she still had, you know, a tremendous amount of challenges. And um, her whole family was separated at times and able to come back at times. And just the amount of um, restriction in her freedom and life in her entire family was just um, very um, humbling to hear. Um, and so I think that it really brought to my attention that even though when all, when something like the Holocaust happens, um, we hear about the worst, but it affected so many more people and um, people that you may interact with every day and you don't know what, what story they have. So I, I think I drew a lot of the same conclusions. Uh, maybe one other thing that uh, struck me was um, it was, in, you know, we, we think of the Holocaust as this, this big, horrible, historical thing that sort of ablates uh, uh, everything else around it. Um, but uh, it was really nice, in a way, to see uh, uh, the man we interviewed um, who had then gone on to lead, like, a very, you know, happy life. Um, he was in a full of joy and uh, the family and the, you know, this is something that obviously had a huge impact on him, but uh, the Holocaust was just like, you know, one thing uh, that had happened to him and he had still managed to populate uh, his life with uh, kinds of wonderful things. So that was sort of comforting uh, from a historical standpoint. Um, yeah, so Stan and I interviewed the same person, Mr. Ed Lessing, um, and I think some of the take homes for me were just that um, each person's experience was so unique. Um, Mr. Ed Lessing was from the Netherlands and was a hidden child. Um, and I actually had never heard their story before that um, these, were, <coughs> these were Jewish people living um, kind of disguised as Gentiles um, wherever they could in Europe. Uh, and I hadn't heard this experience at all. And I think that's something, that was something for me that was, was really interesting. And I think um, even though we've learned about the Holocaust as, uh, and World War II about, as, as this um, terrible event, just hearing each person's unique perspective can be um, very insightful. Um, great. So next question I have is, do you notice any post-traumatic stress disorder, or <coughs> any tremors when they hear the German language amongst the, the individuals that you interviewed? Uh, Nico, we can start with you. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, uh, we definitely noticed some um, post-traumatic stress. Uh, one of these stories that he was telling us, I think maybe in the 80s, the 80s. Um, so he was on a plane, on a flight with his wife, uh, I think traveling back to uh, the Netherlands for the first time. Um, and he, um, he had taken a lot of flights since, um, since he left and came to America. Um, but for whatever reason, this was, his, this was his first visit to the Netherlands. Um, and as he was touching down um, on the tarmac, he turned to his wife and he was like, I, I know that, um, that they're not there right now, but I have this irrational fear that the Germans are outside of the airplane with their tanks waiting to, to take us um, uh, to concentration camps. Uh, and that was a very uh, visceral story for him. And he started tearing up and you could feel it in his body even now, um, I guess last year. That's kind of, that's what comes to mind for me. Yeah, and so, uh, so we, I spoke to the same person, uh, and uh, I think one of the other things that struck me is that, he, you know, according to him, it, it took him, uh, I think, almost 40 years to begin to talk about it. He has since uh, turned into quite a formidable storyteller uh, who speaks in, you know, a lot of different <laughs> venues and schools and things about uh, being a Holocaust survivor and what it meant, and he, he actually organizes uh, internationally a group of people who get back together every, I think, every year or something, and it's, it's all the ch hidden children who, who were sort of, you know, hidden away during the war, um, and so he's very active now, but he, he confesses that for years and years he, he did not want to talk about it, didn't want to bring it up or have it be a part of his life at all, so it's, it yeah, he, it was a huge deal for him, so... Uh, Um, yeah, so along the lines of not speaking about it, I think that was the biggest um, post-traumatic experience of that, Mrs. Strauss. Um, she said she still doesn't speak about it with her children, um, even though her children have sometimes asked, um, and they're grown adults 
now. Um, she's still, I think it's something that's so deep in her heart that she can't, she can't let it down for her children. And even though she speaks to strangers about it, when they ask, um, it's something that's hard for to speak to family. Um, so Dr. Avital, I, I mentioned he um, he did a PhD in history, and he has sort of devoted his life to speaking about his experience. And so um, I asked the question um, about um, PTSD and any symptoms because it was a part of our, our prompt. And he he definitely um, had a lot of sadness and anger about the loss of a lot of his family members and what he had gone through. Um, but to him, it was more important to share his story, and I think that is um, all the more impressive. Um, but also not to be mistaken for um, not to not to minimize what he went through or the fact that some people are so traumatized that they can't. Um, and I was I was speaking to a friend about a similar issue um, about a trauma that she had experienced, and she was feeling guilty that she couldn't do more about the issue. And um, I think sometimes for the people who feel like they can confront it head on. They're the ones who sort of hold the responsibility to do so. Um, and so we shouldn't mistake that for, for not being um, a common manifestation of the, this post-traumatic stress. And so one thing that he did say was that he, he had actually gone to a German high school um, a few weeks before I spoke to him. And the German language was very challenging for him to hear. Um, so just another example of a way in which he um, really went outside of his comfort zone to um, to make a big difference and make a big impact. Uh, do you guys notice any artifacts in their homes, any pictures of loved ones? Did they did they stop and tell you how many siblings that they lost or their parents and point to any pictures in the homes? Sam? Okay, we'll leave my phone. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, he had a whole, I mean, so, I mean, I just know, like, Mr. Lessing has, uh, has now divided quite a lot of time and energy into you know, being more informed and informing others. Uh, so yeah, he has a whole slideshow and pictures and, and, and his story, uh, because he was separated from his family, um, relies a lot on sort of, you know, reminding us, you know, this is where my brother was, et cetera, this is what was happening. And uh, I mean, yeah, it, it sort of highlights how intense and personal it was. Um, he's also taken to, uh, uh, he paints now. And so he's, he started painting. Uh, these scenes that are all like all about uh, his experience with the Holocaust, I think, and and coming to America after that, which is, was really sort of interesting and uh, it was nice to see that he had turned it into this uh, creative thing. Sort of recently, actually, in life. So. Um, yeah, I don't think I have much to add to that. He, I know he's been doing. He's had galleries um, with his artwork, kind of, I think, in New York, maybe in Westchester as well, um, and just beautiful imagery of. Uh, his mother's experience, his own experience, um, throughout the world. Yeah, um, something that really struck me about, well, actually when I was reading um, some of the earlier chapters of his book, which were not about um, the Holocaust, but about his family history, and um, and he his family had owned the same house for several, several generations. And so um, I think, you know, we like to think that material goods aren't as important as our family and friends, but we take it for granted um, and to imagine that being taken away from you, not by you know a natural disaster or anything like that, but by um, a war and, and that those atrocities is really um, sort of hard to imagine. Um, and a more uplifting story about an artifact was that, and he's also written another book about this picture, um, not one of these, but um, somebody took a picture of him when he was a child, and they found him around 30 years later. Um, I don't remember how, but somehow found out who he was, and so that was touching, but also um, sort of emphasizes the point of how, how much personal history those people lost. Um, the fact that so much of their personal lives when they were going through that tragedy um they have no um they they have no artifacts from or, or you know photographs um of, of those times and um and I, another thing i think we take for granted um so she didn't have any personal objects or artifacts that she shared with us but um i thought one of the 
most intimate story she told about us was on about Crystal Knopf, and um, she has this very distinctive story about how Nazis just um, invaded her home, and her and her siblings and her mother had to hide in their bedroom, and they kind of destroyed, she said, they destroyed all the china, they just, she heard it falling, and they knocked it all down, and it made a sheet of um, glass on the floor, so they couldn't leave the room that they were hiding in. Um, and I think it was just such a moving symbol of <coughs> how much the destruction of people invading your home and taking your personal privacy away can really mean. And even though the China doesn't matter to her today, the story and the vividness and the, um, the breach of her privacy is really interesting. And the last question that I have is, with everything that you've learned throughout this entire journey, how do you believe that that, that all of this will help you practice medicine in the future? How, how, what will you implement from everything you learn moving forward as a physician? Um, well, I think um, even just interviewing Mr. Lessing, uh, I thought was was very difficult. Um, we kind of didn't know, I, we didn't have a good organization, and uh, we kind of let him talk, and I think that actually worked out really well for us. We learned quite a bit. Um, and I think even just listening uh, to our patients as we move forward, um, and hearing the details about, you know, also what's ailing them at the moment, but um, learning more about their lives as, we have, as we've been taught through our classes. Um, I think this kind of really emphasized that point for us. For me. Um, yeah, uh, I think, you know, our, our clinical medicine curriculum at the school, at the college, and, and I assume other schools goes to great pains to tell us that, you know, anyone could be walking through your door as a doctor and, and they could have any kind of sort of history. Uh, and, and you know, we, we definitely think about that, but this meeting with Dr. Le uh, Mr. Lessing uh, definitely emphasized that, you know, someone could come in one day and be an, you know, an older patient and they could, be a, they could be a Holocaust survivor. And that would inform a ton of stuff that you would uh, change about the way you would, uh, you would uh, worry about their health. Um, so that was one thing, uh, sort of specifically, but also in touching on what, uh, Dr. Beds, I was talking about, um, you know, and we live in sort of tumultuous times in terms of uh, healthcare policy, I would say. Um, and uh, I think it, it highlighted the importance uh, of, you know, maybe as a future physician that it will be important to not be silent uh, as things, you know, change and, and uh, things are happening uh, uh, in, the, in the health field and sort of just politics in general. Um, yeah, I think on a, on a personal level, it really opened my eyes to talking to patients and people about sensitive subjects. Sometimes I think it's hard to find the right questions to ask and um, to not be too invasive, yet, you know, hear a story or get information. Um, so I think it really just helped with allowing people to talk and to share. Um, yeah, so, I mean, similar lessons and especially about, um, I mean, learning a patient's background is always important to their health. And so from that aspect, not only Holocaust survivors, um, but people of, of any background, just thinking about not only um, the person in front of you, but what their history or their family life could be. Um, and... Um, <laughs> we think that you have the microphone, so, uh, so we'll open this up for a Q&A now if anybody has any questions for the panelists. Either um, folks who want to <clears throat> ask the panelists a question or have some personal reflection on the exhibit or the presentations that they'd like to share, please. And Kevin will repeat whatever you have to say if people can't hear. And I think it is highly likely, for example, we may have some what are called 2G children of survivors in the audience if anyone wants to share. Please, let's use the microphone. <coughs> yeah, um, I actually belong to a second generation Holocaust survival group and we've been made meeting for 30 years. Every other, every... <coughs> Tuesday of the, uh, the first Tuesday of the month. 
And for me, it's been a wonderful experience to be able to share um, my life or my experiences growing up a child of two Holocaust survivors. Um, my parents were both uh, young people. Uh, my father was tenured, my mother was senior. They had both been married to uh, their first husband and wife, and they had both a child with so each one of them lost the child, the husband, the wife, um, and the, everyone in the family, of course. So these are my parents, and uh, suddenly I was born. And so my dilemma was, gee, daddy, how can I, how, Holocaust is why I'm here. You know? uh, and I, it's not bad for me. And he would say, <laughs> knowing that I was confused and, and upset by this, I would say, don't, don't think about that. <clears throat> not your, you have no power here. It's all some divine reason you're here, and it has nothing to do with anything else. And don't question it. Um, he said a lot of nice things to me to make me feel good, and I've shared this with other people today. Uh, one of the other things I remember, he, he would say, I said, Mishi, I called him Mishi because that, it was a teddy bear in Polish, and I called him teddy bear. And I said, Mishik, how, how can you believe in God after what happened to us or to our, the, our Jewish, the Jewish people? And he said, Bibi, I have no problem with God. It's people. So I never worried much. My father, my, my parents were both wonderful people. They had tough lives. They were broken. But they managed to raise me, so I'm grateful to them. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Students are very, very interesting. Um, I, uh, my name is Judy Ehrenheim. I've been on the faculty of the college um, to take some time off, but I never thought of myself as a, as a uh, daughter of Holocaust survivors because my parents were not in concentration camps, but um, they taught us so much. It's only recently that I start thinking about uh, how important it is to really, you know, sort of come out, I guess, and talk about some of these things. I'll just mention two things. Uh, my father uh, grew up in Germany. My mother grew up in Austria, uh, etc. And they met in Michigan. Jews end up in some of the strangest places. Um, <laughs> But um, two things. My father kept uh, scrapbooks from his youth in Germany. And we used to look at all these fascinating things in the scrapbooks. And the thing that's relevant was his story. As he was an intern uh, in 1933 at the University of Berlin at the hospital. And how he lost his job and how oh. Jewish doctors um, couldn't find other work. And how they couldn't get other places and how he finally was able to um, come to the United States. So that's all very interesting. And um, the other thing uh, is just something that came up today during the tour, um, something that uh, someone said uh, in the tour or uh, that the a docent told us about was something that came out of my own father's mouth. Um, when he came to the United States and he saw how terrible the situation was for black people and the lynchings and, all those things, he was just horrified. You know, I just came from uh, the Nazis, and that's exactly what this other person had said, and how that, um, you know, led him to do certain things that he did in terms of civil rights and so on and so forth. But there's so many things, I guess, you know, that I can kind of share. <laughs> and finally, um, you probably won't see as many Holocaust survivors now because they're dying, but you will see, as you yourselves have pointed out, People who come from other places where they have suffered or have had experiences that might have been very, very traumatic. And certainly some of us older folks have treated many people who were really Holocaust survivors. And some of the stories that I'll be happy to share with uh, students, um, there are many of them. So thank you very much for, you, for your thoughts and your observations. Just a quick note, you sort of stir a memory. I, I, uh, two weeks ago, I lost a member of the family, my Uncle Leo, who was 
uh, uh, Slaughter of Auschwitz with two brothers. He was a twin with one of the brothers, and he had an older brother. Uh, all, all three of them were originally from Hungary. They spoke seven languages. People in the family are still trying to figure out what those seven are. We, can't, we got to about five or six, but you get the message. So, so they had the ability, uh, the, lang the knowledge of languages really helped their survival. Um, one story he told us, and we, and we did, by the way, document it on, on a video, on, on film uh, two years ago. It was a project my grandson did for school. Um, his older brother, who knew a language, had, was able to eavesdrop and overhear things that were being said, and he would understand them. And he heard about Mengele, and he heard about the experiments being conducted on twins. And one thing he drummed into his younger brother's heads is, never give your correct birth date. Always give different, they weren't identical twins, so they were fraternal. Uh, never give your correct birth date, um, that, will, that will be a big problem because the assumption was that somehow that would be transmitted to Mengele. And they, and they, and they followed that advice. Uh, eventually, um, um, when they were liberated from the camp, they met a reporter from the New York Times, wouldn't you believe, who was there um, to report on the, um, the rescue of children uh, by, by, uh, by ship. Uh, and at the promise that the brothers made to her that they would serve as interpreters of, of the various survivors and the various languages, they uh, got entry into the, into the uh, passage to the ship. Uh, and made it to this country where they, they had full and long lives. He, he died at age 92. I can't help but say that you give me two pimples. You're talking about my first cousin, Leo Willinger. Oh my God. Yes. Oh, I'm shocked. And this other lady was talking about her father from Germany. My father was a physician in Germany and left in 1938 and had to start his life over again. So we are all so connected and it's so important to share these stories. It's, it's amazing. I have to hear your last thing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the time has flown by. We don't want to overstay our welcome of our host. Um, thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Kevin.